first presenter uh, has, uh, has been in the European Python community for a very long time. He's also a Django core developer uh, who I believe these days is responsible for migrations. Yeah. Well, he seems completely worried about that. <laughs> Today he's going to be telling us how to SSL all the things. Please welcome Marcus Holterman. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks for PyCon, okay, PyCon for having me. SSL all the things. Um, short introduction to me. I'm from Germany, uh, living in Berlin these days. My regular contributions to Django started in about 2014 when I picked up every other back in the migration framework and then the core team back then got tired of merging my pull requests so I merged them myself at some point or had to do that myself. Um, and well, yeah, these days I work at a senior software engineer at Laterpay in Germany and we do micropayments for online content providers and should be easy as going out for dinner, you buy for or you purchase Article, articles online and at some point you pay your tab. SSL all the things. Ever since Snowden proved that the NSA is spying off on all of us, which is a pretty bad thing or pretty serious thing over in Germany for, privacy, for the privacy laws and, and regulations we have there, um, we want to make sure we have something to protect ourselves against that. There's also the risk of public unencrypted Wi-Fi's. Um, you don't want the owner of a cafe you're constantly going to to be able to wiretap your communications with other people. Maybe you are doing your well, you work from the cafe and have your business communication over this Wi-Fi. And online content providers sometimes or some ISP inject advertisements in HTML in unencrypted websites, which is a pretty insane thing to do in the first place, but also comes with a bunch of security con concerns, cross-site scripting to, be named, to name one. So everything, or one way or the best way to probably protect you from this is to, well, have an encryption on the communication channel you have and make sure nobody can inject or wiretap anything of that. But before I go into any details, I need to tell you something else. I'm not a cryptographer, so all examples here I give here are either to the best of my knowledge or to the best of the knowledge of people I trust. And if there's anything in here where you feel you know that this is wrong, please talk to me afterwards before I publish the slides so I'm not telling people the wrong thing. Um, I'm not going to cover everything in this talk about SSL or cryptography because that would be too much and probably enough for an entire conference. SSL 2 and 3 are broken, just don't use that. Um, TLS 1.0, 1.1 are discouraged and superseded by 1.2. If there's a reason to use 1.0 or 1.1 for distribution reasons, then okay. If you can avoid that, then why have that at all? And future-looking cryptographers at Google started implementing a thing, a quant post-quantum cryptography algorithm called New Hope, called after the Star Wars movie. SSL, what is it? Or what's TLS? Well, first of all, SSL stands for Secure Socket Layer and TSL for Transport Layer Security. But, well, these are two words. They are both cryptographic protocols for communication systems and, most no notably, networks. Either one provides two out of three parts in information security. The first of that is confidentiality, which is ensured due, uh, by encrypting the content. So that means nobody can read what is transmitted or the underlying thing that's being transmitted. The other thing is integrity. All the messages you submit or you, you send SSL or TLS encrypted are signed. That means nobody can modify them and you ensure that what you send is what the other person receives. The third thing in information security is availability, which is something you cannot cover in on a protocol level, that easily at least. Um, this is something you probably do with autoscaling in, on AWS or something. Now, how do we actually get to TLS, how do we get SSL working? And this is something where 
a couple of years ago, Let's Encrypt came up. It's a organization that tries to or that provides free SSL or TLS certificates. In order to understand how that works, we need to figure out or need to understand how SSL, this entire certificate thing, works in general. And this is a slightly complex graph, but it's the way how the entire trust system, the trust behavior of certificates works. You have your browsers or email clients and they have a bundled so-called trust store. This is a collection of, of certificates your browser vendors trust. So this is the, this is the thing that you rely on or your distribution or your browser relies on when validating any of the SSL communications you have. So for example, you see root CA there. Um, this is whatever it's included in a trust store. And a CA can then have so-called intermediate certificates, which are certificates signed by their own probably root um, certificate. That means you include the root CA in the trust store and have intermediate certificates that are signed by that that you can more easily use to distribute and, and to, to sign other certificates. The certificates you see at the bottom are the leaf, leaf certificates. So these are the certificates you used, use for all the sites out there, or all the services you have out there. That means once you have a certificate in the trusted in the trust store, it's and it you have a, ch a trust chain down to a leaf certificate, the leaf certificate is trusted. Now the you see root CA three on the right side. This is not included in the trust store. And this, is, for example, is Let's Encrypt as of now. They are not in the current trust stores of, the, of all modern browsers. These are Chrome, Firefox, um, what's out there? Safari, Edge. Um, they are going to be included in, I think, I believe, uh, Firefox 50, um, which is a f major step for Let's Encrypt. Right now, they are so-called cross-signed by another certificate authority. And because Let's Encrypt has control over their own intermediate certificate, which is signed by someone else who is trusted, they can use their intermediate certificate to sign all your certificates. And since we have a certificate chain from root CA2 to the intermediate here to all your leaf certificates, you have a trusted certificate chain. Now let's talk about Let's Encrypt a bit more. I said it's a root, cer uh, root certificate authority. That's not in the global trust store. Mozilla is going to add it in Firefox 50. Um, Let's Encrypt has control over their intermediate set and they can sign everything they want. And sign everything they want is essentially the thing where Let's Encrypt started to do something that's slightly re revolutionized the way certificates are issued this, uh, these days. Let's Encrypt offers a an JSON API that you can use to ask them, please sign a certificate for these domains for me. And this process is called ACME. What you need for that is an account key, which is um, probably our A key you use all the other way you use that for um, in, in SSL encryption. You need a certificate key which is another one and should be different to the account key having the same there poses a security risk. And you need a um, certificate signing request which essentially is a thing that w that you send to Let's Encrypt and ask them, can you please sign a certificate for these domains? And when you have these three parts, you can go through the process. This might look a bit intimidating right now, the, this diagram, but it's fairly straightforward. You have your yourself or your server on the, on the one hand side, and you have Let's Encrypt on the other. This authentication 
the, the first step is that you use your authentication key or your ex account key to authenticate yourself or the, your server against that's encrypt. Hey, this is me. You send the account pu um, key's public key signed with a private key, which then established, um, which then authenticates that this key belongs to the one who signed it. And Let's Encrypt starts knowing you. You can include email addresses or pager numbers or something in there to, at later points, be able to be notified for about expiring certificates. Now, when you've authenticated yourself or registered yourself, it is pretty much the same process in this step. You send Let's Encrypt this signing request, signed with your, pri with your private key, so Let's Encrypt knows that it's you. And you get a so-called challenge back. This is a specially crafted string or, or file you're supposed to put in a specifically uh, defined directory on your web on the web server. So you make this file available to via HTTP because we don't have HTTPS yet, and that's encrypt is going to request this file for each and every domain you ask them to sign, which is this step here. You send them, okay, I brought this challenge to, m to the file system, it's able to be served. Please do the validation of, an of the challenges. And this is what happens here in, this in the third step. Once this is done, you can ask Let's Encrypt for the certificate. And this is a bit of a polling option because Let's Encrypt doesn't notify you when they validated all the challenges. But anyway, you ask for the certificate and you get either, I'm not sure what, what kind of response if it's not there yet, but when it's there, you get the certificate that you can use. You write this certificate to whatever file system you have, wherever your web server is able to use it, or whatever service you want it to use on, and well, you have SSL. You have an SSL certificate. So far, so good. How do we actually use that? Well, you got multiple options. There's an official client that does all the magic. F they have implemented an Apache 2 configuration system, daemon, whatever thing that rewrites your Apache config files and does all the magic with them, so you don't need to worry about that. I believe they are working on Nginx implementation as well. I'm not the biggest fan of that. This is something that should not be done by some service that is that has an, a will on its own. This is something that, from my perspective, is something a configuration and management system should do. Why, if you oh, if you want to know why, look um, watch my talk from last year's PyCon Australia on configuration and system management. There's also a script called ACME Tiny by Daniel Rösler. That's about 200 lines. If you and implements exactly the process I showed before. It's really easy to understand, 200 lines of Python code. When you want to use Let's Encrypt, have a, ha have a shot at it, have a look at it, how it works. It's really good to understand how the entire process works. Um, if you are in a system that uses systemd, maybe use my fork that has systemd integrations for that. Um, there are a bunch of other tools. There's a Let's Encrypt AWS by Alex Gaynor. I haven't used that myself, but seems legit as in um, I know him and he's on the, for example, on the Django security team and does a lot of security related um, op things in, in the Python world. There's R proxy by Ember Brown, which provides a reverse proxy, kind of auto configured a reverse proxy that you tell, okay, I want to have these domains they are proxied there and it does all the SSL magic for you. I believe it's written and twisted and a couple of other things. Um, so there are a couple of tools out there that, that you can use. Now I mentioned before you need to make these challenges available to Let's Encrypt and you need to do that via HTTP. HTTP is pretty much web server so let's have a look at an Nginx configuration file. Um, you can read that. Essentially, you say, I have port 80 example.com, and in dot well known ACME challenges, 
you point to a directory where you write these challenges to and serve all the files that are existing, otherwise you serve a 400. And for every other file that, or every other request, you serve a 400 as well. Now, this makes all the challenges available to Let's Encrypt, and when they validated them, you get their certificate. Great. Now, how do we actually use the tools? Well, considering that we use um, ACME Tiny, or I use that for my own websites, and we use it at DjangoProject.com, um, yeah, it's like 60 lines. You put this in a cron job and uh, run this every month, and you're done. Um, well, you probably need to restart Nginx as well, or whatever web server you have, but it's straightforward from there, I guess. Um, it boils down to the same. You need an account key, you need the certificate signing request, you need a directory where you, send, where you write the challenges, um, where you write the certifi certificate, and the way SSL works, or how, it, how you're supposed to implement it, is that when you look, I think back about the diagram with the root certificates and the intermediate ones, you include the intermediate certificates in your in the certificate file you're serving on your through your browser, and essentially this combine adds this intermediate certificate for Let's Encrypt. All right, now we got an SSL certificate. How do we actually use that in Python? Let's start with the client side. This is a bunch of code. I do understand that, but it's I think it's fairly straightforward. We have a main function and in there we open a socket and we set a we create an SSL default context with a purpose for server auth, which means we authenticate against a server. Then we also don't want to use TLS version 1 and TLS version 1.1. I mean, this is something you can do or you cannot do, depending on if what your requirements are. And you wrap the socket that we opened before and pass in a host name that you want to validate it against. This is essenti something essential you got to do. If you don't put in the host name, any valid certificate there would be valid even though it's a different host name. So google.com with a, some other lit, um, certificate would suddenly be starting to be valid. You don't want to have that. You connect and then handle the connection, whatever that means. This is no magic from our perspective. The server side looks more complicated. And there's more things you can do wrong on the server side. It's also a lot more code. But well, it's a server application. Nobody meant to. Nobody thinks that writing those are easy anyway. Again, you create a socket and bind it to an address and port. So that's these lines here. And you c again create an SSL default context. So this default context is. You can create it with with Python built-ins. Does whatever your current Python version thinks is the best practice at this point of time when it was compiled. There's another way to to create a, uh, a context if you feel really paranoid and want to do it yourself. Read, have a look at the Python docs. But I believe you all run up-to-date uh, envir uh, system environments, so. You have all the latest Python versions, security updates, and all the things there. They should be fine. You can, again, exclude a couple of protocols. For example, TLS 1 and 1.0. Or you can't, so, or, or you don't. So if you exclude it on the server side, you're s not, and you don't have TLS 1.2 on your client side, then they won't be able to connect because, well, you have a set of protocols on the, or versions on the one side and a set of versions on the other side that don't overlap, so th this is not going to work. Then the next thing is this cipher string. This is some cryptic, well, what looks like cryptic string, and I'm 
not going to explain what all these different parts in there mean because I have not the best knowledge about that either. This is something that I asked or I looked at other websites that do a really good job at tel to tell at telling you this is what you currently should do. I give you a couple of links to where you want to look up those details later. Well, and then everything from there is again, I guess, fairly straightforward. You accept uh, connections and for every connection you wrap the socket, handle the connection and once it's terminated or when you got an SSL error, well, yeah, you deal with it. What I didn't cover but at least want to mention because it's a, to it's a wide topic and there's a lot of things you can or could talk about but yeah, this I want to mention a couple of things to you because I feel they are, you should have heard about them and then have a couple of points where you might want to follow up on. There's a certificate revo revoca revocation, which is something when you want to do SSL in any form at, your at work, this is something you should be aware of and you should know how to do that. Because when you need to do that and you don't know how, how to do it, it's already too late, kind of. So certificate revocation means that when you have a certificate which is in production use and is compromised because the key for that is being compromised, you want to have a way to make sure that you in in no time change the certificate with something that's not being compromised. And if you don't have the plan and have a plan plan in place that you hopefully tried out as well, then you waste time there in which your users are um, can be subject to attacks. This is the revocation um, process is part of the SME protocol or SME process, which is not covered in the slides before, but it's covered for the um, Let's Encrypt API. Same applies for the account key. If your account key was compromised, well, you kind of have lost unless you figured out and now how to replace your account key and tell Let's Encrypt, oh, by the way, please don't accept this account key anymore. I'm now known as this one. Again, this is probably something you want to try out before you actually use everything. Then for HTTP and HTTPS, um, HSTS, HPKP, so HTTP strict transport security and uh, public key pinning are two things you might want to look into when you do HTTPS. But be aware of that when you turn them on and are not aware of the risks, you render your website inaccessible for people who have visited the time, the website during the time you turned it on when you turn it off again. So look into what it entails and what it means and what problems you may run into if you turn it off again or if you turn off SSL. Public key pinning, so that's for that applies to both of them. Public key pinning is something not necessarily too important for all of us. It's something if you have a high profile company with lots of attacks on, on DNS or on lots of, um, yeah, generally on a, a lot of att attacks, this is something you might want to look into. But at least on Django project, I think we don't use it because it's, it's not worth the effort there. Um, as mentioned before, you have SSL as a Protocol is a pr is a protocol, and protocol generally means whatever kind of communication you have there. And as you've seen in the ex in the code examples there, you don't necessarily need HTTPS or HTTP as a protocol. You can use it for whatever you want to use. The only th requirement Let's Encrypt has is that you serve the challenges via HTTP. So if you are able to have a HTTP server listening on the same domain on port 80 than your other service on port 1234, then you can use as a Let's Encrypt certificate for this other service. Well, things that go ca could go wrong as again, HSTS or HPKP, this is something you want to look into. Leaked keys, as briefly mentioned before, you want to have process in place that you can f just follow when something 
when some of your keys are leaked because this is a serious thing and a serious issue that you need to take care of urgently. People claim or claimed, I'm not sure, that the resource usage for SSL communications is unreasonable high compared to plain communication channels. Yes, of course, we do some cryptography. We need more resources there. But when you have like fairly recent servers, couple of years old, they all do all that just fine. AES and I, as in, in the Intel extensions for uh, their CPUs, is something that could, can be used by, by OpenSSL. This is something that your hardware, your hardware is doing the encryption and not anything software implemented. This is something which is ridiculously fast. And this is nothing that you need really need to worry about these days anymore. All right. Um, as mentioned, a couple of resources you want to look into. Um, Cypherlist is the this magic string I showed you before. I guess they c always have the up-to-date version of just look look up your, st your string and compare it with those. And if they ch differ, then figure out if you can use the new new one or if you have other requirements that or, or backwards requirements or requirements for older browsers that are not supported with the new cipher string anymore. And yeah, just use what if you can just use whatever they s suggest. SSL apps is probably the go to place to figure out all the things you messed up with your SSL config. Um, everything that's I believe everything that's not an A these days is something you can change and you can there's a, you have there's a legitimate reason to be able to to change that not sure if you need a plus on the rating but if you got an F you seriously messed up um Hinnix Lava gave a couple of talks and wrote a couple of blog posts on TLS and how all this entire thing is just complica complicated complex and Everybody does it wrong anyway. Um, there's this is the uh, proto uh, ACME protocol. The so if you want to have a deep read on how it works and why it works the way it works and everything, it's an interesting document. Um, this is the link to the uh, experience uh, experimental SSL cipher, uh, the the cryptographic um, algorithm Google worked on and the gist for the code snippets I showed you before. All right. Thanks very much, Marcus. Uh, questions? Hey, uh, thank you for that. Um, this seems like a great idea when you've got production or web-facing servers. Um, quite often I'm going to want to test my changes before I push it out and one of the things I want to make sure I test is SSL. Is there any way, for example, if I'm just doing a local Django deployment into, say, containers on my machine, that I can get a certificate from Let's Encrypt that's not public facing? No. You need to have, so, well, as long as you're able to, so you can, of course, set your production domain in your ETC hosts and then point it to your container, as long as you also have a, ver a way to Let's have Let's Encrypt talk to that domain, as in the DNS lookup. Let's Encrypt needs to do uh, does is just public DNS, so you need the public-facing server that answers Let's Encrypt requests and ha get the certificates or challenges, uh, like exchange. I think that uh, Let's Encrypt now allows DNS challenges rather than just HTTP. You th okay, right. Let's Encrypt does allow DNS challenges as opposed to, or uh, in, uh, next, or additionally. additionally to HTTP. I have not heard about this. I don't know. I'm going to have a look. Thank you. Can you share with us any uh, case studies or any examples of public websites we might know about that is using Let's, en Let's Encrypt for their SSL encryption? DjangoProject.com, my websites, um, bunch of others. I'm not uh, I think I believe all the WordPress sites out now. So there are I think five million active like not expired and not revoked 
Let's encrypt certificates, which is a really big number. And they are active for 18, to 18 months, two years, round about. Anyone else got a question for Marcus? Sure thing. Uh, so previously, uh, when I wanted to use um, SSL certificates that span multiple domains, um, there's been a uh, uh, there's been a recommendation not to do that because some devices don't support the SNI server name indication mm -hmm. feature. Do you, in your opinion, is that are we past that point where most browsers actually support that, so we can actually <laughs> just get on with it and put put these on the same IP address? Look into what SSL, so get your browser requirements figured out yeah. and then look at what that's, uh, SSL Labs tells you if there's any browser who does not support that, that you need. Okay. Um, otherwise, you, well, you need to serve them on, on different IP addresses, which does not mean, so it's about different IP addresses, not different domains. Sorry, I misspoke. Yep. Yeah. So the SN, um, SNI is sa server name in identification, which means that each domain within a certificate needs to resolve to its own IP address. So you can still have the same certificate for multiple domains, I believe, but all those domains have to resolve to different IP addresses. Well, thank you very much for that, Marcus. Uh, everybody, Thanks, please thank again Marcus Holterman. <laughs> uh,